Okay, so we spent a fair amount of time looking at three different uh, equations or sets of equations. I wanted to give you a sense for the interesting physical phenomena that we can capture using differential equations and remind you of their importance. I'm sure you're also seeing them in other courses as well as you go through your engineering curriculum. Today we're going to talk about some general considerations, specifically the numerical solution procedure. It's a framework that will help us kind of categorize and give some order to the process that we go through when we get numerical solutions of real engineering problems and talk about the two primary most popular numerical solution approaches that you'll face as engineers. So numerical solution procedure, um, I've shown this to you before and I referred to it very briefly earlier in the semester but now we're going to go through it in a little more detail and put some more meat on the bones, so to speak. So we always start with a real physical system. And in each of the three examples we did in the previous videos, you can imagine or think back to what that physical system was. We'll, on the, in the next slide, we'll look at a specific physical system to give it, again, some more detail to this. So you start out with the physical system, say so really Bernard convection flow. And then the first step, so there's one, two, three steps in the numerical solution procedure. The first step is to apply whatever physical laws apply to that particular situation, typically conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So these are physical laws that we know to be true. And then we may also incorporate models. Models imply assumptions. Models imply some level of approximation. So we'll make clear what the laws are that we're enforcing, as well as what models we are taking into account. And so that takes our physical system, the actual real physical system, and applying these laws, that gives us our mathematical model or the governing equations of that system. So this is what you're doing in many of your other classes. So if you think of MMAE202, for example, solid mechanics, Blue mechanics 313, heat transfer 323. So that's what you're doing in those courses. You're looking at a particular physical system, applying the appropriate physical laws and models to get the governing mathematical equations, which are usually ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations in engineering settings. And then in those classes, when possible, will typically get the analytical solutions in the cases that they exist. They're usually quite limited. Uh, if you go back through your notes in any one of these classes after you've completed them, you'll find that you've looked at or addressed many, many different situations, only a few of which you're actually getting analytical closed form solutions for them. So that's where 350 comes in. So now we can continue through the numerical solution procedure to get a solution in situations when we cannot use any analytical methods. So the starting point for us is going to be this mathematical model, uh, the governing equations. Then the second step will be to discretize that. That's what we'll discuss in today's video. And dis in discretizing the problem, it goes from a continuous system of equations, differential equations, to a system of algebraic equations. Sometimes they're ODEs, system of ODEs, but more often than not, it's a system of algebraic equations that we're getting, which we can then solve using the matrix methods that we've developed back in Shipley Swiss Chapter 2. And then from that solution, then we get the numerical solution, approximate numerical solution for the original system. And I find this numerical solution procedure to be very helpful when we get into the details of these various techniques and methods and we're talking about Taylor series approximations and we're talking about the discretization methods and so on, I find it very helpful to go back and kind of think about and make sure we're clear on where we are in this numerical solution procedure. So if you ever feel like you're a little bit lost, not quite sure what we're doing or why we're doing it, just ask yourself the question, is this step one, is this step two, or is this step three of the numerical solution procedure? And it's usually pretty easy to figure that out. 
and then you'll see where we are in this overall sequence. It's especially helpful since you're usually doing different steps in different classes. So again, step one is what you're doing in many of your other engineering courses, and steps two and three are what we're focusing on in this class. So you kind of have to piece it all together to get the full picture. All right, so let's look at a very simple example. And that's a forced spring mass system. We like spring mass systems because they are easy to imagine, they're intuitive, they make sense in terms of their behavior most of the time. And um, we can go to Home Depot and build these easily, test them. And it just gives us a, and the math is, is pretty straightforward. So we have a spring, a linear spring with spring constant k, with a mass hanging, mass m hanging down which is being forced at a forcing amplitude f and cosine omega t omega is the frequency of the forcing. So this is kind of similar to that force stuff in the equation that we looked at. And then we're going to measure u as a function of t up like this. So u as a function of t, that's our dependent variable, u is, t is the independent variable. And as this wibble wobbles up and down, the u of t will give us that position of the mass. If you know the position of the mass, you know the force in the spring and, and everything else that you would like to know. We're going to call the force in the spring f sub s. And we define the zero for u such that f sub s is zero when u is zero. when the position is at its neutral position. Okay, so we're just going to walk through those three steps and see how, how each of them come in. All right, so step one, we're going to apply the physical laws and models. First, ask yourself what physical laws are relevant, what physical laws govern a system of this type. And in this case, it's a dynamics problem, so it's just conservation of momentum in the form of Newton's second law. Now we can have an argument about whether Newton's second law should really be called a law or a model. Uh, I would argue, and no one would disagree with this, that it's really more accurately deemed a model because there are assumptions. So conservation of momentum is a physical principle. It has to be satisfied. It is a physical law. But in the form of Newton's second law, as we call it, it's really a model. We're not dealing with relativity effects. We're not dealing with quantum effects, there are some assumptions that go into Newton's second law. So it really is a, a model in the strict sense of the word, but everyone calls it a law. So we'll apply Newton's second law as the physical law that governs such a system. Then our models, assumptions, and approximations. This is probably the most important part of doing these problems. As an engineer, our job is to take complicated problems and then step one, convert them into something that's mathematically tractable that we could actually solve, whether exactly or numerically in, in our case. So this is the part where you, I always talk about two different speeds when you're doing problems. This is, this is the part where you slow down. You go into that slower speed and you really think through these assumptions and approximations and models and make sure they make sense for your situation. And in the end, you have to think ahead because the mathematical model that you get will depend on the assumptions that you make. And the mathematical model that you end up with is then what you have to solve numerically. And so that's going to affect every later stage in the numerical solution procedure. But as we would normally do in a, in a dynamics class, we're going to neglect the mass of the spring. We'll say that the mass of the mass is big enough such that the mass of the spring can be neglected. We'll assume that the spring is linear elastic. So that just means that if you were to plot the elongation u, and force will plot minus f sub s in, in the spring, is just a straight line. So minus f s is k times u. So a linear elastic spring, linear behavior between the position or the elongation, and the force in the spring, and the spring constant is the proportionality constant. So that this is what you see down here. That's the equation you see there when we get to the derivation. So linear elastic spring. Finally, we're going to assume that the drag on the mass 
is going to follow what's called Stokes drags, the Stokes drag law, which applies generally pretty well for low speed movement of an object. So we are going to take into account the drag on the mass. So you can think of it as drag through the air, or maybe this is in a in water, and so there's some drag uh, because of that. Okay, so again, you, you know, as you go through these, kind of think about how good or bad these assumptions are. There are times where, as engineers, we make assumptions that are necessary in order to solve a problem, but they're horrible assumptions. So in this this current pandemic, there's all kinds of assumptions that go into these models uh, for for how it's going to develop in time, and that's because you just need a model. And then as time goes on, you feed in better better data, more more accurate information about the system that you're trying to model and therefore improve the models. But you need a model. You need something to go on. You need something to make decisions. And so you sometimes make some horrible assumptions knowingly. The important part is you know the assumptions. You know how bad they are. And so that's why you see, for example, in the pandemic models, the number of cases projected and the number of deaths and so on is a huge air bar, there's a huge range that they give when they give those numbers because there's so many uncertainties in the modeling. So that's reflected that way. So anyway, the point is, as engineers, we need to be very clear on what the assumptions are that we're making and how good or bad they are. We need to have a good sense for how good or bad those assumptions are. All right, so let's walk through the derivation. Again, this is exactly what you do in a physics class, a mechanics class, a dynamics class. So we have a linear spring, we already walked through this, so it's the force in the spring is directly proportional to the elongation, so F sub S is minus K times U. All right, so that's the F sub S is the force in the spring, and then F sub D is the force of drag on the mass, and so that is given by Stokes' model for both speeds and it's linear with, with velocity. So the drag on the mass is minus C times V, V being the velocity of the mass, and C is the drag coefficient. Now the minus sign is there because drag is always in the opposite direction as the velocity. So an airplane flying through the air, no matter what direction it's going, the drag is always in the negative direction as rel relative to its direction of motion. Okay, and then we apply Newton's second law. So Newton's second law, the sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. I'm just going to flip it around for the way we're going to write this. So we have the mass. We know the acceleration. Acceleration is the first derivative of the velocity and the second derivative of position. So A is dv dt, and it's also d squared u dt squared. And then um, so we'll, we'll put that in for, well, put acceleration in for A here. And then we just need the sum of the forces. And again, this is all conserving momentum. All right, so let's draw a free body diagram. We always draw free body diagrams. <coughs> when, we're, when we're doing these kinds of static or dynamic problems. So let's draw a free body diagram. I'll stick it over here. So here's my mass. And U, remember, is measured up, positive up. I almost always have my coordinate be positive up, even if I know that the thing is going to go down, because then I don't have to think about signs. And then we have uh, various forces. So we have the weight, W, is mass times acceleration to gravity. We have the force of the forcing. So I'll call that F sub F. And that is the F cosine omega t. Sorry, I've squished in there. F cosine omega t, that's the forcing. Then we have the drag. F sub D. Uh, that's really bothering me. Sorry, folks. I'm just going to erase this mess here. So F sub F, that is the forcing back here. So this 
is equal to f sub f of four sub. Okay, did we miss anything? Uh, yes, we did. Oh, yeah, the force of the spring, of course. Thank you, appreciate that. So the force of the spring, F sub S, then we also have up. Now you stop and you think, wait, 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 so is the force of the spring, is it positive, it's negative? If you do it right, the force will take care of the signs. And so, and this is not a dynamics class, so I'm not going to get it, you know, walk through all the details now, but, but that is correct. So, this is, looks like it's in tension, because the mass is pulled down. Um, probably will be in tension for a good portion of the motion, but may not be. If it's in compression, then this will just be a negative number, so that's all fine. Okay, so we have mass times acceleration times the sum of the forces. We have one, two, three, four forces. Drag force, spring force, weight, and forcing force. And then, so we need to substitute those in. The drag force is minus CV. The spring force is minus KU. W is MG. And F sub F is capital F cosine omega T. So that's our equation. There's one problem. We have one, two, three different variables. We have the position U the velocity v and the acceleration a. But we know that they're all interrelated. We can write all of these terms with respect to the position. So I'm going to substitute in for v du dt for a d squared u dt squared. And then that gives us this. I've divided through by m. And so that's our governing equation. So d squared u dt squared plus c over m under c is the, the drag coefficient, acts like a damping, over m du dt, which is a velocity, it's an acceleration, it's a velocity in plus k over m times position, and then minus g minus f over m cosine omega t. Now you notice the way I've written this is the typical convention that we use, we put all the terms with the dependent variable u on the left and everything else on the right. And then the terms on the right we call forcing terms. Or we say, if it's not zero, we say our governing equation is non-homogeneous because homogeneous would mean this is a big zero, but it's not, so it's non-homogeneous. So this is a second order equation, highest order derivatives two. It's linear which is used in these terms, no u squares, no sine u's. And it's non-homogeneous because we do have a non-zero right-hand side forcing term. It's an ordinary differential equation because we just have one independent variable time. So we have all ordinary derivatives. And then remember we have boundary value, initial value problem distinction. This is an initial value problem because it's evolving in time. So for initial value problems, you need two initial conditions. So you need the position and the velocity at t is equal to zero. So if t is equal to zero, the position is u zero. And at t is equal to zero, the velocity is some initial velocity that we'll specify. So we'll specify the position and the velocity and using those solve our governing equation. So that's step one. That is going from the real system to the mathematical model of the system, the governing equations of the system. Now you'll notice, because this is linear, second order constant coefficient differential equation, this is actually quite easy to solve using standard methods that you learn in Math 252. But we're going to pretend that we don't know how to solve it, we've forgotten how to solve it analytically. So we're going to do it numerically, which brings us to step two of the numerical solution procedure. Step two is the discretization. So we have a continuous system. Everything moves continuously in time. U is a, is a continuous function of time. So we're going to take this continuous time domain, as well as the continuous differential equation, and we're going to discretize it. So we're going to chop it up into little time pieces, as you'll see, and then we'll discretize the equation as well. So the discretization in time time going like this, t is equal to zero, and then we're going to discretize time into a series of, 
into a series of little delta t's. So this is a delta t. So we'll have a ti, which is just a generic time step, we we'll call it. And then the next time step is t sub i plus 1, with the delta t being the difference between them. So ci plus 1 is equal to ti plus delta t. So delta t is called a time step. We discretize the continuous domain into a series of little delta t's. So we discretize the domain, and then we also discretize the equations themselves. So we take our continuous differential equation, which has these first order and second order derivatives in it, and we want to discretize it onto this discrete domain. So we'll go through the formal procedure for doing that in the next video. It's based on Taylor series approximations, but let's just walk through it in a more intuitive way for now. So this is using the finite difference method, which we'll talk about more in the next video. You can also use finite element methods, and there's other methods as well, but we're going to focus here on the finite difference method. So the idea is, is very simple. We're going to take a derivative, which we know what it is. We know what a derivative is. Here's the math definition that we had in calculus class. So du dt is the limit as delta t goes to zero of u at t plus delta t minus u at t over delta t. So the idea is you have the value of u at one time step right here and another time step right here and then you divide by the distance between them so it's rise over run and so in the limit as delta t goes to zero as those two points get closer and closer together you have the slope of the curve at that point. Fine. So the idea for a finite difference method is you take this continuous version of the definition of the derivative from calculus class but instead of taking the limit as delta t goes all the way to zero, let's approximate it when delta t is small but finite. So it's, delta t is still going to be itty bitty small, but we're not going to take the limit all the way to zero. So then we can take this ratio, rise over run, and we can, we can think of that as, we can think of that as a, an approximation of the actual true derivative. The smaller the delta t gets, it's still finite, never zero, but the smaller it gets, the closer to zero it gets, the more accurate that approximation will be. All right, so such finite differences then, or which are differences in the dependent variable between adjacent finite time steps, as I just said, that's going to allow us to calculate the position u at the current time step using values from the previous time step. So we're, we think in terms of marching. So we start at t is equal to zero. We know the initial conditions. You get the solution at the next time step, the next time step, the next time step, in sequence, one after the other. And that's the procedure that you'll see when we solve these initial value problems. Generally what this amounts to, in the end, after you discretize the equation on the domain, discretized domain, what you get is a system of algebraic equations. Remember, this is step two of the numerical solution procedure. So we're taking the continuous differential equations. We are approximating them, discretizing them, to form a system of algebraic equations for the u's at each time step. So we're no longer solving for u at every time. We're solving for the u's at the specific time steps in our discretization. So that brings us to step three. So now we have a system of linear algebraic equations to solve. That's what we discussed in chapter two. So we don't need to discuss that for now. Uh, so we have a big matrix problem to solve in general. We solve it using methods from chapter two, and we get the numerical solution again, u at the specified time steps. So here's an example, g 9.81, mass of 1, k of 1, c of 0.01, f of 1, omega of 0.2. And I put in the position, initial position is 1, you can see that here, initial velocity is 0. 
So it wibble wobbles back and forth as a typical oscillator would, and you can see how that evolves in time. This is from 0 to 100. Okay, so that's the numerical solution procedure. Apply the laws and models in order to get the governing equation for the system we're trying to model. Take that continuous differential equation, discretize it, that's step two, onto a discrete domain. That typically produces a system of linear algebraic equations that we can then solve in step three for the numerical solution. Okay, some comments on this, and then we'll discuss finite difference or finite element methods. So there's the two Vs. So whenever you're doing numerical methods, you hear this all the time, garbage in, garbage out. So you need to be able to decide and determine and assess how good your numerical solutions are. So there's two steps, the two Vs, validation and verification. And this encompasses all three steps of the numerical solution procedure. And this is why I find that so helpful. So basically what's happening is every step in the numerical solution procedure is introducing a new set or new type of errors. So there are modeling errors. There are model, there's errors in the mathematical model because of the assumptions and approximations that you've made. Then you discretize it in step two. That introduces an additional set of errors because of that discretization, because your delta t's are finite, they're not, well, they're not zero. And then you have the numerical errors from getting the solution of the system of algebraic equations, depending on how you do that. So every stage in the numerical solution procedure, one, two, three, produces its own set of errors. So the validation and the verification are addressing the magnitudes of each of those errors in the following way. So validation, they're alphabetical, so A before E, that's how I remember it. So validation, we're quantifying the modeling errors. So we have all three types of errors, and we'd like to have a sense for, of those three types of errors, how big are each one? So we separate out the modeling errors in the validation process. So we want to determine those errors in our computational model. So again, this is step one. It's addressing the error introduced by step one. So the questions that we're asking are, am I solving the correct equations? Am I capturing the physics correctly? And is the solution qualitatively correct? So qualitatively correct means, does it make sense? Does it, does it fit my intuition about how such systems behave based on my experience with those systems? So validation is accomplished through comparison with highly accurate experiments. So if you're gonna compare back to reality, the only way to truly do that is to test an actual system of that type. So you actually have to go to Home Depot, buy the parts, build it in the lab, and do the tests. So that you can compare your solutions against that to quantify step one. So that's the validation step. Verification addresses steps two and three together. So this is the quantification of the discretization and numerical convergence errors in the computational model and the corresponding solution that you get. So again, this is step one, this is steps two and three. So now the questions you're asking are, am I solving the equations correctly? So I, I've convinced myself that I'm solving the right equations. Now am I solving them correctly? Am I capturing the mathematics correctly? Is the solution qualitatively, I'm sorry, quantitatively correct? Remember, this is qualitative, now this is quantitative. So the verification then is typically done by either comparison with benchmark solutions or highly accurate numerical solutions that you've done before. So benchmark solutions are solutions that have been done often in various fields. People get together and discuss certain canonical problems, standard problems that people will test their codes against. They're usually problems where we have good experimental results, we have good numerical results, they're highly accurate, so if you develop a new code, you can test against those to make sure and verify that your solutions are consistent with the benchmark solutions. So everything we do in this class, and of course many others as well, is addressing one, two, or three, one aspect of the numerical solution procedure. So again, in this class, we're looking primary, primarily at the verification step, steps two and three, and in your other classes, you are looking at step one, the validation step. Okay, there's various numerical solution approaches. Uh, we're going to discuss two of the most popular. 
So this is step two of the numerical solution procedure, how you do the discretization. So there's finite difference methods we've introduced briefly and then finite element methods as well. These are by far the two most popular techniques used in engineering and science. They're not the only ones, but they're most, the most generally applicable and widely used. Our focus is going to be on finite difference methods, and this is because they're used all over the place, they're relatively straightforward, and um, they're just based on Taylor series, which I'll review in the next video. If you want to see more background on finite element methods, we do have a class, which is an elective class, it's not a required class, MME 451, but I'd strongly encourage you to take that later in your academic career to learn finite element methods. It's very powerful and widely used. So I'm just going to take, give you kind of a one slide summary of each to give you a sense for the pros and cons. They're highly complementary in many ways. So first, find a difference method. So the basic approach is we discretize the governing ordinary or partial differential equation in differential form. So that's exactly what we just did. We had the differential form of the governing equation for the wobbly spring mass system. As you'll see in the next video, we're going to use Taylor series based finite difference approximations at each grid point and that's going to be the basis for the discretization that we, we apply, that we use. It produces a linear system of algebraic equations at each grid point. It's a local approximation method. You have a, an approximation at a point, so for the solution near a point, based on these discrete points. Very popular in research because some of the advantages that I'm going to highlight next. It's relatively straightforward to understand and implement. Again, it's just based on, on the standard Taylor series. And we're going to be using what are called structured grids. Structured grids are just what they sound like, highly structured, highly ordered grids or meshes, whatever you want to call it. It utilizes the familiar differential form of the governing equation. So it's usually the form that you first derive in these other classes. Typically, when you're doing a conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, you apply them, you apply them to little differential elements of the fluid or the solid, and then from that you get these differential equations, and it's the differential equations that are the starting point for our finite difference method. So it's a very natural continuation of the, the approach that we use in, in other settings. Uh, we can apply this to a wide variety of problems. We can get into very complex physics, which is why it's very popular in research. So in my field of CFD, computational fluid dynamics, I have my basic CFD codes. I can relatively easily pull in other physics. So if I want to add in heat transfer or combustion or acoustics, sound. So I can add in that additional physics without too much trouble into my finite difference model. It's typically produced as very sparse and highly structured matrices. So in step three, the system of algebraic equations that we need to solve is usually very large, but it's sparse, meaning it has lots of zeros in it, and it's highly structured. So, for example, triagonal matrices, we, we talked about those earlier in the semester and the advantages of that. The disadvantage is really a big one, though. It's more difficult to implement for complex geometries, which, again, is partly why it's popular in research. So oftentimes in research, the emphasis is not necessarily on complex geometries. It's often more on complicated physics and getting highly accurate solutions for that complex physics. So uh, we recognize this big disadvantage, and that's really addressed through finite element methods. So the basic approach now is we apply conservation equations in integral form rather than differential form. So when you take 313 fluid uh, mechanics, you'll actually see the governing equations in both. You'll drive one, you'll drive the other, you'll see it in both forms. Um, so the integral form, which is mathematically equivalent, is the starting point for the finite element method. So when you then, then do step two, when you do the discretization, it's going to produce a set of linear or nonlinear algebraic equations. If it's a linear problem, it'll be a linear set. If it's a nonlinear problem, it'll be nonlinear system of algebraic equations. So that, you know, if it's not linear, it's going to be more difficult to solve. It's still a local approximation method. So it's looking at finite elements, little pieces of your domain, in terms of what's happening at the surrounding pieces. This is very popular in commercial codes. By commercial codes, I mean the ones that you go out and spend 
tens of thousands of dollars on, or well, you don't, but companies do, to use in, a, in an industrial setting. They really came out of the solid mechanics and heat transfer area, so it's very, very popular in those fields. It's moved into other areas like fluid mechanics and some others as well. The advantages, I only list one, but it's a huge, and that is you can treat complex geometries very naturally using the inherently unstructured grids. So unstructured now, there is no ordered arrangement of the grids, or you know, often you find elements that are little triangles or, or uh, different shapes. But now you can piece those shapes together in whatever relationship you want to get these very complicated geometries. And, and again, that's one of its main advantages. Disadvantages, unstructured grids have additional overhead. You have to do additional accounting, calculation to keep track of where all these grids are. And that can increase the computational complexity of the code itself, as well as in, in terms of overhead, reduce the, the computational time. Solution methods are comparatively inefficient because the matrices that you get are typically dense and unstructured. So dense is the opposite of sparse, and unstructured, of course, is the opposite of structured. So you have smaller matrices typically because you can't solve them as big because the matrices are dense and they're unstructured. They don't have, say, a triagonal structure to them. Um, so that's typically what you're going to have to solve then in step three, and you have to take that into account in the, the discretization step. Okay, next time we'll look at the formal basis for finite differences based on Taylor series approximations.